next few moments together, I invite you to come along with me and explore the wonderful realm of awe-inspired science. Now, when I speak of awe, I'm not just talking about the wonder, amazement, inspiration, or luminous enchantment that discovery and understanding affords us. Awe for me is an acronym for art, wonder, and the experiential, where awe becomes the portal for scientific engagement. You see, I believe when we create experience and use our art, wonder transpires. And I believe that awe needs to be an integral part of the science, technology, engineering, and math proposition. Because with awe, it helps us transcend the barriers or boundaries to science concepts seemingly intangible before. When awe enters the equation, there is scientific assimilation. With kinesthetic bodies moving, voices singing, hands painting, team collaborating, learning. One cannot but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one merely tries to comprehend a little of this mystery each day. Never lose a holy curiosity, says Einstein. And as every parent knows, children begin life as uninhibited, unabashed explorers of the unknown. From the time that we can walk and talk, we want to know what things are and how things work. We begin life as little scientists, but most of us lose our intrinsic scientific passion, and it's a profound loss, says Brian Greene, the author of The Fabric of Our Cosmos. I sent some lovers of awe and science in these quotes. And you must understand that by nature, I am an artist, a lover of drama, art, music, and dance. But by nurture, I'm an avid lover of the underpinnings of how our universe works. My love and interest in science began in the fifth grade when the holiest of elementary teachers ever, Miss Ernestine Yarbrough, she allowed a group of 10-year-olds to explore and love to learn by allowing us to write stories using our vocabulary words and our science homework. The only rule was that our vocabulary words had to be spelled correctly and that our science had to be factual. From there, any leap of fancy could prevail. Oh, she was magnificent. She encouraged my writing, my music, my art. She is the one that said, girls, science is for everybody, not just for the boys. And every Friday, Mrs. Yarbrough would come by each student's desk and whisper a word of encouragement into our ears. And she would threaten us greatly in her beautiful, booming voice if we dared to share what was meant for our ear and our ear alone. I have no idea what she said to the others. I only know what she said to me. What a great thinker you are. What a great writer you are. You could be a scientist or an artist or maybe both. She made me love the solar system and all the stars and the planets. And I truly believe my life's mission, really the germination of that seed happened in that classroom. She was the catalyst for my awe. She encouraged all my right brain proclivities to follow whatever path they wanted and then encouraged my left brain to follow suit in concert with my right. In truth, she is the rubric by which I measure how I teach, how I deliver multimedia messages, and how I seek to encourage and inspire. Mrs. Yarbrough knew how to create awe where art and science naturally overlapped. Robert Eskridge, the executive director of museum education at the Art Institute of Chicago, points out the relationship between art and science. And he says that both are a means of investigation. Both involve ideas, theories, and hypotheses that are tested in places where mind and hand come together. Artists, just like scientists, observe, study, seek to understand, and then, upon gathering their data, transform information into something else. And I ask you, what if that something else becomes a dance, a poem, a painting, a piece of music, a design, an innovation, or an invention? During the Renaissance, art and science were not perceived as being diametrically opposite. Rather, one was seen as informing the other. One of the most prolific artists of that period, Leonardo da Vinci, is best known as an artist whose works were informed by scientific investigation. For da Vinci, Art and science were just different paths that led to the same destination. Even in ancient Greece, the word for art was techne, from which technique and technology are derived. 
terms that are apropos for both art and science as both seek to make visible the invisible and strive to create a web of intricate pieces that coalesce into a marvelous whole. Now, an artist might look at a flower and go, ooh, what beauty, what grandeur, what color. A scientist might look at the same flower and go, there's a flower with three petals, three sepals, one pistil, six stamens that spends its day photosynthesizing. Both are astute observations experienced and translated very differently. From Fabiola Giannotti, physicist, concert pianist, and lover of philosophy who leads CERN's largest team at the Large Hadron Collider's five-story Atlas detector, to Commander Chris Hadfield, the first Canadian commander of the International Space Station, who is also a scientist, a pilot, a musician, and a graphic artist. And the list of scientists who are musicians, artists, poets, and philosophers goes on and on. Brian Greene wrote in an article entitled, Put a Little Science in Your Life, that science is one of the greatest adventure stories, that we must embark on a cultural shift that puts science alongside art, music, and literature as an indispensable part of what makes life worth living. And I got to tell you, I have seen time and time again how integrating art and science provides engaging, thought-provoking, awe-infused experiences for students. And that is why science and art belong alongside each other, motivating the other to its highest. Now, because of how I integrate information, let's take a look at the first word in my version of awe as a way to inspire science. You see, I am always on the lookout for multiple ways that art can be the point of entry for the science concepts I'm trying to explain. Now, a few of my students agreed to come today to help better, yeah, you can give them applause, to help me better show you the awe. Now, let me give them enough space. If I want to teach the movements of the planets, I'm going to ask them to spin on their body's axis to explain rotation. Now, next, I want to ask them to create a movement that represents revolving or a revolution around the sun. I like being the sun. Now, now, now I'm going to ask them to rotate on their body's axis as well as revolve around the sun. Yeah, I, I usually get a few dizzy planets, but uh, <laughs> other than that, the concepts of rotation, that's right, and revolution are rarely confused thereafter. Why? Because they've had a physical experience and used their locomotor skills to exhibit and understand science concepts. Now, if I want to teach the life cycle of a star, I'll get the students to dance or create a story with their body of that star. So it goes a little something like this. A star begins to form in a nebula, an interstellar cloud of gas and dust, a virtual nursery for all kinds of baby stars. The gas and dust compress because of gravitational forces to form a slowly moving gas globule. Gravity overcomes the gas pressure and the globule collapses. And the globule spins faster and faster. All of the spinning causes this globe of gas to have a surrounding flattened disk called a protoplanetary disk and a central core. The central core becomes the star, and the protoplanetary disk may one day merge into other planets, other stars, or other asteroids. And if there is enough material in this protostar, the gravitational collapse and the heating continue. The temperature and the pressure increases. The atoms get closer and closer together. The hydrogen atoms lose their electrons. Where'd they go? The gas becomes a high temperature plasma. Plasma! Hydrogen nuclei are then squeezed and squeezed tighter and tighter together. The atoms get closer and closer. Everything gets hotter and hotter. Infinite temperature of about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit is reached. Hydrogen fuses into helium and we have nuclear fusion. The energy made at the center of the star presses outward while the force of gravity exerts pressure inward on all that energy. And when equilibrium is finally reached, we now have a stable main sequence star. But if that star is particularly massive and becomes a red supergiant, then when it is very old and its hydrogen is depleted and it can no longer fuse into helium, the giant star's core collapses. And then when the helium is 
on, it collapses again. And then fusion happens again, and carbon and oxygen are turned into silicon. And then the core collapses, and silicon fuses into iron, and everything climbs higher and higher and higher. <gasps> oh. And now, again, after all that, the silicon has fused into silicon. The red supergiant is now going to experience Iron core overload. Iron is poisoned to a star. The star now begins to collapse from all directions until the iron core meets itself. And the shock waves rebound outwards, causing a tremendous explosion. And the star goes supernova. And I have yet to see anybody not enjoy going supernova. And then I will ask them to collaborate write a song and sing it about the constellations. One, two, three. The big dog is Canis Major and sits under unicorn. Find Orion's shoulder, you can see that unicorn's horn. There's a horse named Pegasus that can fly with its wings. Leo is a lion, there's a ram named Aries in the wide open spaces. Just look up, there's 88 constellations. Animals roam across the sky. It's a party every night. It's not allowed in the wide open spaces. <laughs> Bravo. And then I might ask them to uh, create a rap about the scientific method. One, two, three, four. Encounter, get curious, and ask a question. That's the first step in the scientific method. And here's what's next on the list. Explore and form a hypothesis. Investigation is a natural progression. Now that's the second step of the scientific method. Now test your theory and experiment and see if your hypothesis is evident. It's the third step after the second, and we're halfway through the scientific method. Uh, Whoa. And there is so much more where that came from. Because if I can get a student to dance their science lesson, or draw their invention, or maybe even write a science song or poem, or make a science movie, then all of a sudden that student is motivated to use the whole of who they are, their thoughts, their creativity, and their critical processes in both art and science. And out of their art and their experience, wonder is created. And when wonder begins to ignite, there is no better time than this to remind them of the awesome wonder that sits atop their shoulders, that is their head, that is the housing for their brain, that is the vessel for all their unlimited creative and scientific potential. And you see, I believe we must instill wonder upon every interaction. I always tell every student that I encounter that they are indeed 100% star stuff, that the iron in your blood, the calcium in your teeth, and the carbon in your cells are the same elements that are made in the stars. And then when a student begins to realize that the probability of them being them, exactly who they are as they are with a very unique and unduplicable biological signature is somewhere around one in 400 quadrillion, woohoo! it is it's time to celebrate because they are, you are, we are all thermodynamic miracles. It feels good, doesn't it? I know. And I always try to honor what I see bubbling forth in young people. Recently, I was in Trinidad teaching science, and there was a brilliant young 10-year-old named Hayden. And we happened to be very near the Trinidadian airport. And if we were near a window or we were outside, any time a plane was taking off or landing, he would go, Auntie Janet, here comes a Caribbean 747-830, or Auntie Janet, look at that Citation CJ4. Now it was Greek to me. But to him, it was life. So I began saluting him and calling him Pilot Hayden. Good morning, my pilot. Good morning, Captain. See you tomorrow, Pilot Hayden. By day four of the science camp, he came up to me. He goes, I really like it when you call me Pilot. <laughs> Don't you see? Our words create wonder. I believe it is every educator's duty to speak the most positive of prophecies over every young person that comes into our purview. There was another brilliant girl named Rezaia, and she heard me say in a presentation that 12 men had walked on the moon, but no ladies. So the next day, she handed me a paper, a story she'd written about a future mission when the people of Earth would return to the moon, and a woman named Rezaia would take her first bold steps on the lunar surface. What happened? <laughs> 
she had an experience that led to wonder, and she used her art, her storytelling, to envision herself in the future. <laughs> Socrates says that wonder is the beginning of wisdom. You see, we have the power to create wonder and encourage our students to stand in their inherent magnificence. I'll return again to my fifth grade teacher, and she had the power to create wonder. She could make a D student feel like a king, the learning difference find their genius, and to motivate the shy and unsure into head held high, confident, walking tall 10-year-olds. Because remember, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all, says Aristotle. And so we must allow our students to create and innovate and find their art alongside their science. We must give them experiences that lead to wonder and we must use our words and our love to be the brick and mortar foundation that they build their future lives upon. What you will knit in this cross-disciplined approach will be smiles that are mile wide, notes that become love songs to your soul when they tell you thank you for what you allowed them to unearth in themselves, when they tell you that what they learned shall never be forgotten, when they tell you that 20 years ago they remember when they were 10, you telling them you're good, you're great, you're absolutely terrific, or when you hear them shouting at the top of their lungs, look at me, look what I did, look what I created. Look at the wonder of me, my science, I did that. Then you will know that when you created room for experience, you made room for all. Let's not forget that all must be experiential. We must give our students experience, the experience of touch and taste and thought and process and collaboration and art and science and experiments. In Creating Innovators, the Making of Young People Who Will Change the World, Tony Wagner of Harvard says that we must let our students play because in the midst of their play, they just might find their passion. And in the midst of their passion, they may very well find their purpose. And that is why I believe it is imperative that we create space for the dancing of math and biology, the acting out of our science, the drawing, designing, and illustrating of the world in which we live. We must make it our mission to honor creative thought as the birthplace for every scientific endeavor or advancement that ever has been or ever will be. In and through art and science are sown the threads of innovation, exposition, and understanding. We must never forsake the discovery potential that is indelible when we give art, wonder, and experience a chance to do its most profound good. I'm a scientist. I'm an artist. I'm an innovator. I am a future Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> and for this to be true by several orders of magnitude, we must elevate the awe. <laughs>